So as I mentioned earlier today, the ongoing series of leaks about Twitter censorship policies, known as the Twitter files, revealed detailed new information about how the FBI and the intelligence community, with operatives implanted inside Twitter, actively worked to discredit the New York Post pre-election reporting on Joe Biden's business activities in China and Ukraine. Those efforts occurred even before the Post publishing of that story. There were repeated warnings from the FBI of supposedly impending Russian, quote, hack and leak operations, operations that never materialized, as well as afterwards, including emails showing former FBI general counsel, who magically became deputy general counsel of Twitter, James Baker, insisting to Twitter's chief censor, Yoel Roth, that the Hunter Biden material was hacked in or forged and therefore must be censored, a total lie. No journalist covered the Hunter Biden laptop story and the efforts by the government and big tech to censor and suppress it more closely than Miranda Devine, a columnist for the New York Post and author of the book Laptop from Hell, Hunter Biden, Big Tech, and the Dirty Secrets the President Tried to Hide. In a columnist for the Post today, she described how Democrats, led by Congressman Adam Schiff, are now scrambling to maintain their ability to censor and control big tech platforms amid public outrage over the mounting evidence of collusion between the government and big tech. At the very same time, they're waving the free speech banner. She writes, quote, In the dying days of this powerful reign as overseer of the nation's intelligence agencies, abusing his access to the nation's secrets, Schiff's final assignment is to preserve the censor regime, his side of politics, entrenched across big tech. For our interview segment, we'll speak to Divine about all of this and more. Hi, Miranda. Thank you so much. Um, As someone who's really admired your work, I'm so delighted to have you on our show. Thanks for being here. Pleased to be with you, Glenn. So let me begin by asking you, uh, obviously, the Twitter files is coming out daily, including today. Today, uh, the revelations concern a story that enraged me from a distance, but you up close, (laughs) you actually work at the newspaper, whose reporting was censored by a lot of these lies and by the FBI and Twitter's relationship. What do you make of the Twitter files in general and of the revelations today? Look, I think today is the first time we're really getting to the nut of the problem at Twitter. And and really, it's all about the FBI. The FBI was coercing Twitter. And as you just said, uh, Facebook and probably Google and YouTube and so on to censor Americans. And uh, our particular interest is the Hunter Biden laptop story. And it turns out they went to enormous effort to pre-bunk our story. And uh, how did they know to do that? Well, they knew because they had been, the FBI had been surveilling Rudy Giuliani, who gave us the hard drive. And uh, Rudy Giuliani had, of course, become President Trump's private lawyer. And a month after that, the FBI took out this covert surveillance warrant on him. So during 2020, they were spying on his cloud. They would have had access in August of 2020 to the email, very um, detailed and forensic email that came to Rudy Giuliani from the owner of the computer repair shop. John Paul MacIsaac, who had a copy of the laptop, he'd given it to the FBI back in December 2019. So they knew it was real. They knew he was a legitimate guy. And suddenly he's kept a copy of the hard drive and he has uh, contacted Rudy Giuliani and and spilled the beans on particularly the Ukraine, the, the corrupt uh, energy company Burisma that was paying Hunter Biden a million dollars a year. And that's a very tricky subject for Joe Biden. And so they knew that they had to just quell this story and they had to crush it before it was born. They had to make sure it was dead on arrival. And then uh, they would have also had access to my um, very few text messages with Rudy Giuliani, but enough in the beginning of November to let them know that the New York Post was working on the story and that it was imminent. So in September of 2020, we know that there was a ta- uh, what's called a tabletop exercise, I think, uh, in which the FBI and Twitter and the New York Times and the Washington Post are uh, all engaged in, run by the Aspen Institute. And that tabletop exercise was titled Burisma Leak, and it basically ran through a hypothetical scenario of exactly what happened. The laptop 
becoming public, the Burisma material becoming public and being damaging to Joe Biden, except there was a twist. It was all fabricated by the Russians. So what they were doing was grooming these journalists and the Twitter employees into thinking that when they saw our story that was inevitably going to be published before the election, they would immediately recognise it as the Russian hack operation that the FBI had been warning them about for a month. So Miranda, you know, one of the, I was just talking about kind of decade old values on the left, certainly a centuries old value in journalism is that you don't believe the intelligence agencies and what they tell you without at least seeing some evidence before you assume it's true. You know, I stake my career, as you know, on writing about the laptop because as someone who's worked on large archives, to me, all the evidence of authenticity was present from the start that I've used in the Snowden case and many others to publish it. But what always amazed me was it was so clear that these journalists and these big tech companies that decided to proclaim this to be Russian disinformation, meaning it came from Russia, it was hacked by Russia, the information was forged, never had any evidence for that because it was a lie. Why do you think they were so willing to nonetheless affirm it? I mean, we see the Twitter internal communications where they say, oh, wow, we have to suppress the story. How can we do it? Let's cite the hack policies, but we have no evidence that it's hacked because, of course, we now know it was a lie. Why were they so willing to believe this lie, both media outlets and big tech? Yeah, and it wasn't just believing the lie. They didn't do just the basic reporting that you would do. You could just call up the people who were on the emails that we published and say, hey, did you get a copy of this email? Is this real? Tony Bobolinsky was out there in public, Hunter Biden's former business partner, CC'd in on a lot of these emails. He had duplicates of them on his own phones that he handed over to the FBI and that we had as well. Uh, you know, there was just no excuse not to check this down. So it, it's the willful gullibility of uh, these national security reporters at the New York Times and Washington Post, um, their their desire, I guess, to get rid of Donald Trump, everyone was on the same page. So when the FBI uh, started seeding these lies into Twitter and into the main news organisations, they were pushing on an open door because they didn't want Donald Trump to win and they didn't want anything that was detrimental to Joe Biden to materialise just before the election. And... Also, I think there's something a little more sinister, which is the, um, the, the fact that, you know, the CIA and the FBI, the intelligence apparatus, has managed to insinuate itself into the ranks of reporters uh, who, 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 I guess, report on uh, national security issues. Um, they, they, they seem to be able to be um, anonymously quoted uh, the whole Russia collusion hoax was a, a, a symptom of that. You know, the Washington Post and the New York Times won Pulitzers for a story that was just a tissue of lies and quite obviously dishonest. But they seem to be gullibly trusting their sources. And I just have to turn back and say, you know, I'm unfortunately one of those people back in the Iraq war who believed what we were being told by about WMDs and I, I, you know, I thought the FBI and the CIA would sort of, you know, there might be a few rotten apples, but they wouldn't really lie about something so important. How naive and stupid was I? I think a lot of conservatives were like that and a lot of us were red-pilled by the Iraq war as the dawning realisation came that actually what people like you on the left, what Noam Chomsky and John Pilger had been saying that we had dismissed as conspiracy theories of the left actually all ended up being true. And now the shoe's on the other foot. I mean, it's hilarious. I suppose if the intelligence services or the security apparatus um, is helping your side of politics, maybe you're more likely to believe in them. You know, one of the, in addition to the learning the lesson that the intelligence agency lies lie from the Iraq war, the other lesson was supposed to be that media outlets also said that they learned a lesson, which is that, yeah. you know, it wasn't just Fox News. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update. Catch our full shows for free live weekdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on Rumble and join our Locals community at greenwall.locals.com for all of my written journalism, exclusive after-show Q&As, and more.